do an introduction and why we are here. So basically the audience is majorly corporate councils who have a lot of questions um, as the Nigerian Bar Associ as Nigerian Bar Association elections is coming up. They feel they, they want a voice and um, they feel this is just the perfect time to have um, a parley with you, especially if in the event that you uh, are elected um, the president of the NBA. Before we go into the main issue uh, and the main um, cross of the matter today, I would like to just um, drop a few ground rules which will govern this conversation. Uh, please, please let us all note that we have the Q&A box, which we can drop our questions. And um, please note that it's different from uh, the chat box where you can parley with uh, our colleagues and, and so on and so forth. So I'll start sir, uh, with an introduction of our guests. Um, our guest today is someone, is the managing partner of SPA Ajibadi and Co. He was called to the Nigerian Bar in December 1989 and was elevated to the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria in December 2007. He's the first member of the Nigerian Law School set of 1989 to be so elevated. He obtained is an LLB degree from the University of Ife, now Obafemi Aulewa University in, 19, in 1988. He obtained an LLM degree in corporate and commercial law from King's College University of London in October 1990. He also has a PhD degree in private international law from the same university in October 1996. He's a fellow of the Institute of Legal Advanced Legal Studies in London, an international practice fellow of the International Bar Association, and a fellow of the, of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the United Kingdom. He combines the role of an advocate, a corporate commercial solicitor, an administrator, a reformer, and has excelled in each of these areas. As a distinguished advocate, some of his milestones include the following. He made law in the Supreme Court. He led the team in the Supreme Court decision in Fashaki Foods Limited against Sushanya in 2006. And he was able to convince the Supreme Court that the provision of section 22 subsection three of the Federal High Court Act was unconstitutional. He also represented a client in the groundbreaking litigation before the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice, in which the Republic of Ghana was found liable to the client in damages to the tune of 800,000 US dollars for breaching the client's fundamental human rights. He also represented a leading Nigerian conglomerate in arbitral proceedings in the London Court of International Arbitration, in which arbitral award in excess of 550 million dollars was compromised and settled based on evidence that the sole arbitrator had misconducted himself in the course of proceedings. Similarly, as an accomplished solicitor, he led the team that acted as solicitors to consolidate breweries PLC in his merger with Nigerian breweries PLC. He also led the team that represented SRM Partners Limited in his acquisition of Fresh Shares Limited, a wholly whole subsidiary of FBN Holdings PLC. He also represented broad communications in the divestment of his shareholding in Airtel Nigeria PLC. He represented the Nigerian insurance brokerage company in its acquisition by and merger with a multinational insurance company. He also led the team that represented First Bank of Nigeria PLC in his suspended 500 billion debt insurance program. As a business administrator and business and businessman, he, was also, he also has extensive experience in corporate commercial practice and company sectorial practice and has been involved in Nigerian capital market as solicitor in several public offers of security as well as mergers and acquisition. He's a founding member of the Capital Markets Solicitors Association, Solicitors Association, the CMSA, which was founded by Chief Anthony Digby SCN in 2001. And Dr. Ajibari was his pioneer secretary in two, between 20, 2001 and 2007. His vice, president, his vice chairman in 2007 to between 2007 to 2011 and chairman 2011 to 2013. He's a he was also a member of the rules and regulations subcommittee of Sex Capital Market Committee from 20, 2002 to 2004 and is vice chairman from 2004 to 2010. In recognition of his good judgment and business service skills, he was appointed to the boards of reputable companies, some of which are V Mobile Nigeria Limited, now Etel PLC, EcoBank Transnational Incorporated Lumia in Togo, Farmic Nigeria PLC, a wholly owned subsidiary of Danone France, and the International Chamber of Commerce Nigeria. As a family man, he's happily married with four children. 
please welcome me in, please join me in welcoming Dr. Abjibadi, Babatunde Abjibadi, SAN Fellow, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Welcome once again, sir. Thank you very much, Ayo. All right, sir. So I'll just go straight into the question we are in a session. We've received quite um, some questions which we will be throwing to you. Well, we'll start off with the, with the question, which I believe I speak the mind of um, most um, corporate councils and um, corporate practice, law practitioners here. And the first question we have is, if you are elected as the president of the Nigerian Bar Association, what would be your distinct plan for company secretaries, legal advisors, general counsel, and the body of general um, corporate councils? Thank you, Ayo. Um, my distinct plan for corporate counsel for that group that you have described would be to integrate them more into the activities of the MBA. Um, I know there's a, ever since the creation of the MBA section on business law, uh, there's been a conscious effort using the SPL as a platform to uh, get corporate counsel, general counsel to uh, be more active um, and I believe that they are more active uh, in the SPL. Uh, but my, my vision really would be to integrate them, to integrate them as well as the SPL more into the mainstream uh, of the MBA's activities. Okay, now thank you, many, many thanks for, for that. Um, now, recently I am aware that there was a controversy um, where a senior advocate of Nigeria advocated that all his fellow colleagues um, and other learners should come together and enthrone a senior advocate as the president of the Nigerian Bar Association. Um, there has been some other agitation in some areas, especially in regards to some other um, junior lawyers to feel that um, the office of the MBA president is not an exclusive preserve. Of, um, the, of the SA, of the office of the SAM. So um, what will be your take on this? And, and we have your thoughts on this. Um, I, I've already made my position on this public. Uh, I, I, I think I was the very first to react to uh, Chief Aumola's uh, unfortunate statement. I disagree with it completely. Um, I don't think there's any basis for it, either in the MBA's constitution or even in the historical antecedents of the MBA. Uh, everybody, I don't think there's anybody who disputes that the, the most popular, most effective president the MBA has had in its history was the late Alawa Kabashon. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Alawa Kabashon was not a senior advocate. Uh, and indeed, as uh, Ferdinand Obi has since said, I wasn't even aware of this, but Ferdinand Obi, SA, and has since pointedly identified the fact that there have actually been more non-SAN NBA presidents than there have been SAN NBA presidents. So even historically, it, there's nothing to support the contention that the presidency of the NBA is reserved for, for SANs. Um, I, I don't believe that that is the case. And I think that the leadership of the NBA should be uh, determined based on the character, the capacity, and the plans of the individual for the MBA, not on the title uh, that he or she has. Mm, interesting. Many yeah, thanks for that exposition. Um, um, I'll, um, I'll just go into another question, which is um, which we received along the line. Um, so, a corporate counsel wants to know that will, they want to know if you will make it a priority to facilitate Nigerian citizens who are abroad, who are non Nigerian qualified and qualified in a foreign jurisdiction to qualify remotely or at least make the process easier? Um, um, I don't know if you're able to get that question. Um, this was a question okay. we received from Mr. Wali Ulufunwa, a corporate um, law practitioner. So he wants to know if you make it a priority to facilitate Nigerian citizens who are abroad and who are, and who are not qualified um, on Nigeria um, but who are already qualified in a foreign jurisdiction to qualify remotely or at least make the process easier for them to be qualified in Nigeria, I believe. 
So I, I believe it also speaks for lawyers that have foreign qualification but who are not qualified in Nigeria. So he's asking if there will be some sort of process to make it easier for them to be able to practice in Nigeria. I, I think, you know, the, the question uh, is not so much about citizenship. It's about the nature of your training. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, whether you're Nigerian or not, if, for example, you studied law in China, I don't think the fact that you're Nigerian or if you studied law in a civil law jurisdiction, I, I, as you may know, the, the two broad families of um, legal, legal thought are the civil law and the common law tradition. Now, if you were trained in a civil law um, uh, background or, or jurisdiction, I, I think it would be a bit difficult to say because you're a Nigerian citizen, um, it should be made easy or easier for you to 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 qualify in Nigeria. I, I think I think what we should do, and like I said, I wouldn't so much tie it to citizenship, I would tie it to the training that you've received, is that anybody who has qualified in a common law jurisdiction, because the common law really is, um, the basic principles of the common law are the same world over, uh, should, that we should make it easier for people who have such qualifications uh, to, to qualify here. The, the, the hurdles they should be caused or made to jump should be only such hurdles as are necessary for them to understand the local uh, idiosyncrasies of, of Nigerian law. But once they have experience within another common law jurisdiction, I agree entirely that we shouldn't make it unduly difficult for them to, to, re, re, to be recertified to practice in Nigeria. Mm. Mm. Okay. And thanks for that. Um, and I think I, I subscribe to that thinking also, so that um, to ensure that we have some sort of standardization of um, the process. Um, um, also, we have another question here. Um, and as you say that, um, so um, corporate counsel wants to know what your view, what your views are regarding the liberalization of the Nigerian legal sector. We have also asked if capacity building should be synonymous with liberalization. What are your thoughts on this, sir? Well, liberalization, um, it, it, it's, it's uh, something that we have to uh, confront in a much more methodical manner. Uh, liberalization is taking place already. Uh, I had the privilege of being on a, on a committee that was established by a former NBA president, okay, Wally SN. Uh, I think that was 2012, thereabouts. Um, committee was chaired by Yemi Kandi Johnson, SAM. And it was on this issue of liberalization of Nigerian legal practice and whether we should open our doors to allow foreign international law firms to, to come and practice in Nigeria. Uh, and we came to the conclusion that it, it's inevitable that sooner or later, we're going to be, uh, be compelled to open our doors if not as a result of treaty obligations, be it WTO, be it AFCTA, just as a result of, of, of pressure, uh, pressure from multinationals and our need to attract foreign direct investment. If, if there's a perception that the investment will not come or comes in a reduced manner because the, the, uh, the, the law firms that piggyback on these multinationals are not being allowed to, to come in with them. Uh, but we also realize that there is a need to protect our legal, our, our domestic market, and that it would be foolhardy for us to open our doors to international law firms coming in here to set up until we have strengthened our own local market and until we had significant capacity in terms of skill, uh, because that is what is lacking. I mean, a lot of these international law firms, going back to Mr. Lufunwa's question, for example, a lot of these international law firms have loads of Nigerians working within them anyway. So it's not that the skill is not there, um, but we don't have the skill to compete effective with, effectively with them domestically. And we think that we should increase our skill and improve on our regulation before we, we open our doors. Uh, so it has to be a calibrated thing. Uh, and we should study what other jurisdictions have done. There are a lot of examples to, to copy from. Uh, Malaysia, Singapore, a lot of the Asian tigers, where they've opened their doors in a structured manner. It hasn't been just a, a free for all, 
They've allowed international law firms, but restricted them to specific areas of practice, uh, all designed to protect the local industry. So restricting them from practicing domestic law and say they can only practice international law, et cetera. These are all things that I think that we must consider uh, and, and, uh, and do in due course. Oh, thank you very much for that. And uh, quite, quite enlightening and quite uh, um, an eye-opener, uh, frankly, on a personal note. Um, so um, did, my next question flows um, from this general feeling in, in the call press council space. Uh, that the NBA is significantly tilted and focused on litigation practice. Um, specifically, we received a question from Mr. Timothy Badia, who felt that the profession is rigged against corporate attorneys in terms of privileges and relevance. Because according to him, most of the regular content to which litigation lawyers go to court to argue on are prepared by corporate counsels. Hence, the corporate counsels keep the litigation lawyers um, in business, in court. Now, the question and, um, from corporate councils, which I believe I speak their mind, is that if you are elected NBA president, NBA president, under your watch, what will you do to address this perceived disparity between advocates and solicitors, and therefore change this narrative? I think that there is a lot that needs to be done in that space, but I think it's a lot that needs to be done on both sides. Um, uh, you know, I think we need to be pragmatic. I'm concerned that we don't have sufficient statistics in our profession, and that is one of the things that I would like to deal with if, if, if by God's grace, I'm elected NBA president, because a lot of what we deal with is based on speculation. I think it's difficult to plan effectively for any, any group of people, any association, if you don't have the statistics. But even without the statistics, I have no doubt in my mind that the majority of Nigerian lawyers are litigators. Um, I won't be surprised if it's in the region of 75 to 80% of Nigerian lawyers are litigators. So, so, so to that extent, um, I don't think that it is un, unreasonable or it's a matter of surprise that this group of lawyers have dominated um, the affairs of the association. But I think it is unreasonable for them to dominate the affairs of the association to the exclusion of other groups of lawyers. Uh, and goes back to what we said about the SBL. Uh, it goes back to what I said about SPIDL, uh, about SLP. This, 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 this uh, um, sections and various fora, uh, if properly utilized, should enable every lawyer, irrespective of the nature of your practice, to find a place within the MBA where his or her interests are adequately uh, uh, dealt with. And to a large extent, if I had my way, there should be some form of proportional representation. So assuming, you know, just for, for the sake of argument, like I said, that 75% of the profession is made up of litigators and 25% is made up of corporate practitioners, uh, or, you know, 25 cent, 25, I think that each of those sectors should have a proportional degree of representation in the MBA and in the MBA's management. So, so I mean, there's a provision, and I've made a, an open, um, I've given an open undertaking to the Law Officers Association of Nigeria, for example, uh, who have complained about the provision of Section 83, I think it is, of the MBA Constitution, which says that only private practitioners. Uh, can aspire to hold national office within the NBA. And I agree with them entirely that that is unreasonable. There's no reason why corporate counsel should not be able to aspire uh, to, to uh, hold national office in the NBA. It's not just about law officers. Uh, so, so these are some of the discriminations that have, um, uh, that have been established over time that I think we need to, to do away with. But we need to do away with it, keeping in mind that, you know, the tail is not likely to be able to wag the dog. If the majority are in a particular area of practice, naturally, you know, they will have um, uh, an influence on the organization and on decision making going forward. But it must be within the context of allowing everybody to, to have a, a say. And my, my slogan on which I, I base my aspiration to lead the, uh, the association is that we must have a united bar. 
there's no way we can have a united bar if we don't give everybody a sense of belonging and give everybody, including corporate council, uh, the belief that their voices will be heard and that their concerns will be will be addressed. Thank you very much. Quite quite insightful. Um, and um, as a follow up um, to what you um, actually mentioned, which is um, about the section eight about the need to be legal practitioners to. Um, aspire to national offices. I'm going to also follow up by saying that a lot of corporate councils also feel aggrieved. Uh, and seems like, yeah, and it seems as though um, efforts in, from this space is not being recognized. And uh, for instance, now um, I've had a lot of arguments and a lot of agitation that um, uh, corporate councils are excluded in the award of the rank of senior advocates of Nigeria. Um, the, the, they've made a case to say that there are people in the corporate council space who have done significantly um, and added a lot of value to the legal profession that, that ought to be recognized. But as we speak currently, um, only legal practitioners who are in full-time practice and in some instances, um, academics are given the opportunity of becoming senior advocates of Nigeria. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Sir? Well, you know, my, my thoughts are that again, those are those are aberrations that have been born out of the fact that the profession has historically been controlled by a particular group uh, of those that practice it. Uh, and unfortunately, by dint of that, some of these uh, habits or um, or conventions have been reduced into statute. So for example, the, the eligibility for appointment as a senior advocate is not, is not really uh, down to the MBA now. It's not an MBA thing. It is written into the uh, Legal Practitioners Act. Um, you know, and it, so that it's a statutory um, uh, uh, provision. I personally have no reason, I see no reason why um, if, you know, some argue that because it's it's a senior advocate of Nigeria that if you must appoint um, solicitors or corporate practitioners, you would need to change the name. But then my counter argument to that is then how how come you give academics? Academics are not academics, advocates exactly. either. You know, so if you give exactly. Professor A or Professor B, who have never some of them have never stepped into a court, uh, you know, how do you justify giving them senior advocate of Nigeria and then exclude them? Um, uh, solicitors. So I, I think it's just a, a lack of will. Uh, I, I definitely am not of that school of thought. I've, I've spoken to some uh, distinguished uh, uh, solicitors who I know and who I personally feel are more than deserving uh, of being uh, appointed to whatever, you know, whether you call it senior advocate or you decide to call it senior solicitor of Nigeria, I think that they're deserving of the same degree of recognition. The only question mark that I've raised, and I've raised this with them, uh, is what would be the criteria? Because the truth is, even the rank of senior advocate of Nigeria, uh, for those of you who, who know the late Pa Gomez, uh, who just passed on uh, uh, last year, I mean, he, he, went, he went to his grave agitating for the abolition of the rank of senior advocate of Nigeria because he felt that it was, even amongst advocates, he felt that it was unduly discriminatory. And he felt that the process and procedure by which senior advocates were, are appointed uh, lacked transparency and was not based on merit. Uh, so my only concern with the agitation uh, for solicitors to be either appointed senior advocates or even if we were to create another rank is that we need to be careful that we articulate or that we're clear as to what criteria we want to use so that we're not replicating the problem that already exists even with senior advocacy in that a lot of people are not happy. It's not just about the, the fact of uh, that other people other than advocates can't be made senior advocates, is that people are not happy with even the process by which senior advocates mm. are, are appointed. They think it's, they think it's, it's too arbitrary and um, uh, not merit-based. Now, I think we would have the same challenge if, if we created a separate category for solicitors or if we decided to make solicitors senior advocates. The question would be what criteria are you to use? Uh, 
Um, mm -hmm. and it's something that I've asked senior solicitors to start thinking about because we're going to change it. My, my desire is that the Legal Practitioners Act is long overdue uh, for, for mm -hmm. review and amendment. Mm -hmm. so, so this will be the time really in the course of amending that legislation to introduce uh, uh, these issues. And if we're going to introduce them, we might as well come forward with what we consider to be uh, the appropriate criteria that should be taken into consideration. Beautiful, sir. I think um, I think I'm excited when I hear that, and so um, at least I'm sure I speak the mind of other public councils to say that um, it's actually exciting to know that that is being is going to be reviewed because um, we have a lot of um, public council who have actually contributed to this practice, especially in the public council space and in terms of corporate uh, corporate law practice. Um, so thank you very much, sir, for that. Um, my next question, then, which is not. A, which is close to that also. Um, so at a recent interview, um, Lenin um, you mentioned that if elected, um, you would work to fight all, uh, off all aspects of external intrusion into the lawyer's work. In fact, recently there was a recent publication by a tier one bank, wherein SMEs and other businesses were invited to subscribe for legal services. In a lot of quarters, this was considered a serious encroachment in, on the job of the average Nigerian lawyer. What is your take on this? Well, I, I'm sure you know that uh, tier one bank <laughs> very well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, I do. So, uh, uh, so uh, again, this is something that um, I've, I've reacted to. The NBA has reacted to. Uh, I think one at least of the other aspirants to the presidency of the NBA has also reacted to this. I agree entirely, but I, I think we need to put it in context. And um, it goes back to what I said about my, my mantra, which I'm running for this office, the need to build a united bar. I actually think that what happened recently is a, is a success story in terms of uh, exemplifying what we can achieve when we stand united. Uh, because when I saw the advert, I mean, it went viral. A lot of lawyers were up in arms about it. Um, I sent it to the NBA president and, and he said that, yes, definitely it was something the NBA was going to deal with. Uh, the chair, I also sent it to the chairman of the section on legal practice. Uh, and he, he also confirmed that there was going to be a formal uh, protest written. Indeed, I was just informed yesterday that um, uh, the Lagos branch, I haven't seen the processes, but I understand, I understand the Lagos branch of the NBA has actually commenced uh, an action against uh, the financial institution but what i took away uh, what i took away from it which was extremely positive was that i also spoke with the um, senior legal officers corporate counsel in that financial institution and also with the chairman of the uh APCL, i think it's called the association of banks legal advisors ablac bank legal advisors and company secretaries yes and they, they, yes, and they confirmed to me that they themselves were aghast at the publication when they saw it, that it had nothing to do with the corporate counsel in the bank, and that it was a publication that was generated by their marketing department, working in conjunction with some external law firms. And at the moment they saw it, they insisted that it be pulled immediately, um, which I thought was great because uh, I, the worst thing would have been, which was my initial concern, my initial concern was that this was corporate counsel within a bank uh, trying to provide legal services to the bank's customers, circumventing uh, or excluding their colleagues in private practice. But it turned out that that wasn't the case. And I was happy that, you know, corporate counsel within the bank were at one with us, uh, who are uh, external counsel, that it was most inappropriate. Uh, for the bank to have put out such such an advert. That is the kind of collaboration that I think I'd like to see between corporate counsel uh, and the NBA and private practitioners going forward. Okay, beautiful. Thank you so much uh, about that. Uh, um, then my, our next question then is this. Um, it, I, we want to know um, if the NBA under your presidency, if elected, um, has any plans to undertake some sort of advocacy to ensure that the, our laws are updated to ensure efficiency and to support the exigencies of corporate practice. Um, for instance, the corporate councils have lamented at different times about the obsolete nature of extant laws governing corporate 
law practice. For instance, the Companies and Allied Matters Act still remains obsolete, and um, in the recent attempt to update it was stopped um, at some point, leaving um, corporate councils with an obsolete camera that is on that is not fit for current um, practices, corporate, current corporate law practices. So what are your intentions to ensure that Kama is amended finally if it gets passed? Are there plans uh, for the NBA to be playing some sort of advocacy role in this regard if they're elected president? Yes, definitely there, there are. Um, I know for a fact that the NBA uh, and the SBL um, have already and are already taking steps in this regard. Um, there's a NASBA, there's a group called NASBA, the uh, uh, Nigerian uh, uh, Business, uh, sorry, I can't remember what the, the acronym stands for exactly, but I know that it's a collaboration between the, the NBA, SBL, and the National Assembly to assist the National Assembly in identifying all the laws, not just, not just CAMA, for a lot of the laws that exist in our statute books that are outdated and that are requiring a significant updating amendment or reenactment and that is that is an initiative that must continue um, i think that the nba must also engage actively with the law reform commission because there is a standing uh, body called the law reform commission that is supposed to review our laws on an ongoing basis, basis. Uh, and, I know that, yes, and I know that the National Assembly actually has, um, or recently it was drawn to my attention, I shouldn't say I know, that the National Assembly actually has an office uh, within the National Assembly complex uh, mm. reserved for the NBA uh, to assist them uh, with ongoing reviews of, of, of laws. So these are all um, uh, institutions or organs that I would activate uh, if, if elected uh, president. I think that is that we must be on an ongoing basis. Oh, oh, thank you very much, sir. And that would, I'm sure that will be well appreciated because uh, well, I, I'm sure you're aware about the crisis, uh, a mini crisis um, corporate consoles faced this, uh, this uh, during the, the COVID pandemic where um, annual general meetings were not held, uh, were not yeah. able to hold under normal circumstances. And so uh, it was felt that um, if the camera was significantly updated, um, it would be able to cater for such instances as, as that. Um, so my next question then um, is this, um, I, I followed the recent interview you granted, um, where you mentioned that if you were elected the president of the NBA, you would work with um, relevant agencies to improve, to ensure improved remuneration and treatment for lawyers undergoing the mandatory NYSE program. You also said you work with relevant institutions to enlarge the employment space for lawyers to reduce the pressure of law firms and keep lawyers being fully employed. How do you intend to achieve this? I think by constructive engagement. Um, you, you know, the first thing that I think it's important um, that we must do as a profession, and I'm already working on that, and I would work on it whether I, and I'll continue to work on it irrespective of whether I succeed in my aspiration or not, yeah. is that young lawyers coming into the profession are not being provided with sufficient guidance as to the variety of options that are out there. Um, I think, you know, the, the pressure that is, that is on law firms is, is enormous. And law firms as currently structured, the market as currently structured, cannot accommodate or absorb all these lawyers. And I think that there's so many important roles for lawyers to play in society that, you know, I actually don't believe that we have too many lawyers, even though we're generating, we're producing almost 7,000 every year. I think that there are roles for them to play. It's just that those roles are not being properly articulated and those roles are not being properly funded. So I'll give you, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there's a police duty solicitor scheme that's been run by some branches of the MBA. Uh, the most popular one is the one that was being run out of the Korodu branch. And a few other branches have been running them. Now, these schemes are run on a pro bono basis. So the lawyers that participate in them uh, do it of their own volition um, uh, and almost as corporate social responsibility. I don't see any reason why this should not be uh, uh, standardized and institutionalized. Personally, I think that every 
police station in Nigeria ought to have a duty solicitor paid for. If government will not pay for it, then we will raise the necessary funding for it, either for multilateral uh, uh, development institutions uh, or for corporates. I mean, I'm sure if I came to some of my colleagues on this call and, and we articulated the benefits that we seek to, to gain from doing this, we'll be able to raise funding for it. And by so doing, raise jobs. I, I don't know how many police stations there are in this country, but definitely I think there'll be a lot of jobs to be created there. I think that every local government office in this country, we have 774, ought yes. to have at least one legal officer. Yes. Then, there, then there are the corporates. There's civil society, there are a lot of civil society organizations. I just spoke about the National Assembly. I think the quality of the legislation that uh, is coming out of our National Assembly, out of the state houses of assembly, out of even the local governments, because they also pass you know, bylaws, et cetera. I think there are a lot of roles for lawyers to play that we are not tapping into. Uh, and we are, we are allowing the young lawyers coming out of law school to, to feel that the only path available in the profession is to get a job in a law firm. I don't think that that is the case. Yeah. And also my interaction with some of these young lawyers, what, what you find is that a lot of them are square pegs in round holes because all these various roles that I say lawyers can play, different lawyers have different natural tendencies. They have a natural flair. So somebody who, is a, who has a, a natural flair towards a, a constitutional human rights issues uh, asking that person to apply to a commercial law firm uh, where they're doing mergers and acquisitions and capital markets work, he or she is not going to find fulfillment or satisfaction in that job because that is not what is his or her natural inclination. So I think as a profession, we need to be playing a more significant role in assisting young lawyers as they come in uh, to the profession to identify what their strengths are and to assist them to find uh, uh, fulfillment in the profession that will enable them to 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 uh, exhibit what their natural uh, strengths strengths are. That's right. that, that, that. Thank, thank, thank you very much on that. In fact, it's a, it's a great um, idea that I've just had. Um, thinking about putting um, legal officers in the police stations, which will, for me, it will increase to improve the level of um, understanding of the law, um, even from, from the police station um, up, up there, especially when you, you know, situate it against the fact that um, we have youth corporate lawyers who are always returned or rejected by potential employers and who are always looking for where to serve. Um, if, we are, if we have an abundance of legal officers that can be employed, um, I'm sure that um, it will be it's a great idea for them to um, be able to be um, employed at the police station switch. So I actually applaud that, that initiative if it eventually comes, comes, comes to pass. Um, again, um, recently, sir, um, you indicated that one of the things we are to expect under your presidency, if you're elected, was the increased appointment of young lawyers into positions of responsibility um, within and outside the NBA. Our uh, question then becomes this. Will this also apply to corporate counsel and its in-house legal practitioners? For instance, I'm aware that, that um, most uh, when we, the Nigerian Bar Association Conference has been organized, um, the, the, the uh, committee, the organizing committee is majorly made up of um, legal counsel on um, full practice firms. Uh, is there any plan to incorporate corporate counsel into these appointments and into these kind of initiatives? Most definitely. Um, and as I said, I mean, this, in recent times, you know, it's interesting what is happening um, in the NBA. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite delighted by the, the direction of travel by and large, because I mean, I'm a, and I keep going back to talk about the SBL, but truly, um, I'm a founding member of the SBL. I was on its council for four years. Um, I chaired the conference planning committee for its 2016 conference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the SBL has been a very good vehicle for uh, trying to raise standards uh, within the NBA uh, and make the MBA a much more 
uh, cosmopolitan uh, organization. Uh, and I think that we've achieved that. What I think we need to be careful of, which as a, as a core member of the SBL had always advocated is that we should ensure that we don't create silos. And I'm seeing it happening because this question you're asking, I think that more than ever before, in the last, what, maybe four years, the quality of the NBA's flagship event, which is its annual conference, has improved significantly because of input from the SBL. I mean, the SBL's annual conferences have always been, you know, close to international standard. And it was always my hope that we would be able to infuse some of that SBL spirit into the NBA. And it has happened. It is, it is happening. I mean, the last NBA conference, I think, was, uh, was as close to, to international as well as SBL standard as, as one could expect. So, so, and I think that is largely because uh, the corporate council, uh, as well as corporate law firms, you know, because it's not just about whether you are in-house, whether you're in private practice or not. It depends on the nature of your practice. And the truth is a lot of our practitioners, the majority of our practitioners are solo practitioners. Um, and because of the nature of their practice, um, the level of exposure uh, is also relatively uh, limited. But I think the more we get corporate counsel and the more we get corporate law firms uh, involved in the activities of the MBA, and not just on the sidelines, but in an active manner, then it will, you know, it will improve uh, uh, the standards of the, the MBA's operations right across board. And I'm seeing that happen already, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm glad that that is the case. Mm, thank you very much. That's actually quite insightful. Um, so we have a question here um, uh, that, um, uh, there uh, are considerations that uh, actually, uh, while you spoke earlier, you spoke about the association of banks, um, legal advisors, and company secretaries. Um, similarly, I'm aware that there is also the association of company secretaries and legal advisors of the manufacturing industry, uh, for which I am a member. I'm also aware that is the NECAS Committee of Company Secretaries and Legal Advice, Advisors, uh, which I belong to also. Um, a signal number of such groups exist. Um, the question then becomes, uh, and some of these counsel, some of these lawyers do not belong to the SBL. The question then is, if you are elected NBA president, will the NBA be reaching out to these groups such that we can then have inclusion in the affairs of the NBA by these groups? Um, I would like to, I, I would like to reverse that slightly. Um, okay. I, I think that those groups should reach out to the NBA. Okay to ensure that you know, the MBA is aware of their existence because you've reeled out a long list. Those are the ones you know. In all probability, there's some that even you don't know. That's because true. there's so many subsets within our profession. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, it is very easy uh, for us to, to criticize and say that you know, the MBA uh, is not carrying uh, its members along. And that all the, all, all the MBA does is collect branch, uh, practicing fees from them and branch duties. <laughs> But then if they don't stand up to be counted, if they don't make their presence felt, if they don't make their presence known, I'm not sure that we can continue to blame the, the MBA for, for their lack of participation. They themselves need to engage. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I am hoping to, to uh, do, if, if by God's grace I'm elected, which will require that everybody um, uh, gets involved, and I think I've mentioned it already, is we need to know who we are. What, how many lawyers do we have in Nigeria? What, what is the nature of their practice? What is the nature of their job? You know, if you're in private practice, where do you practice? Is it a law firm? Are you a solo practitioner? How many partners in your firm? What is the type of law you do? Um, well, how much do you pay your staff? You know, because you get a lot of complaints about welfare. I don't see how we can deal with these issues about the welfare of the legal professional when we don't even know what the current state of play is. So I think it is important that we have that information. And one of the questions that I would like to put in the questionnaire, which, which I'm already working on, is, you know, which, which associations are you a member of? So if you're a member of the company secretaries of manufacturing uh, industries, please let us know. If you're a member of the Capital Market Services Association, let's know. If it is the Real Estate uh, Lawyers Association, there's so many of them. I mean, I was on a program the other day, 
there's a Elan, em, Employment and Labor Law Lawyers Association of Nigeria. I, did, I didn't know anything about them until, <laughs> until I was invited to participate. So there are probably as many of these associations as there are That's lawyers out there. Yeah, yeah, but the NPA is the umbrella body that covers yeah. everybody. And everybody mm. must get involved in the affairs of the NBA and make their voices. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, sir. I think I support um, um, what you've just said. And um, just to read out a comment from Mr. Mrs. Ayatollah Jagun in support of what you have just said, uh, she feels that um, corporate counsel, um, who are all on this call, um, should find out what is out there in the NBA and get involved. And we should stop hiding in our silos and ensure we get engaged the affairs of the MBA because there are different fora and sections that are actively recruiting lawyers from all sectors. This is just to um, um, support what you have just said uh, about the need for these associations to reach out to the MBA. Um, thank you very much sir, for, for, for that. Um, we have another question here, sir, and that is to find out what your plan um, for a proper regulation of legal education is in Nigeria. Um, the author says he understands that this is the responsibility vested in the Council of Legal Education, but he believes that the MBA has a critical role to play uh, for proper regulation of legal education. He feels that the quality of our outputs leaves so much to be desired. And he also believes that there are too many lawyers scrambling to service a $400 billion economy. What are your thoughts on this, sir? I agree entirely. I agree that the MBA has a role to play. I mean, the Council of Legal Education um, has MBA representatives on it. Uh, uh, and I think that over the, over the years, uh, it, it wouldn't be incorrect to say that the MBA representatives on the council uh, have perhaps not uh, done enough um, to, to assist uh, in improving the, the quality, the content uh, of the, the curriculum. But the truth is, um, there are changes now, there are changes that are taking place uh, in the world uh, and in our, prof our profession is not, is not excluded. That will, by force, by force of circumstance, uh, cause all of us to, to start thinking uh, differently about what our lawyers need to be taught. Uh, and it's not even just for those who are training, even for those of us who are already in practice. Uh, the challenges that we're now all being confronted with, uh, with increased use of technology, uh, is going to necessitate a lot of, you know, retooling uh, and, and retraining right across board. So I, I think the MBA must play a role, a role in that. Uh, it must play a role in in, uh, in making our, our profession a lot more responsive to uh, to the changes that are taking place. Uh, and, and as uh, as um, uh, I think it's Mr. Mr. Unwodo says, um, we also need to start thinking about opening up new uh, practice areas. Um, I mean, he says that there are too, we're too many uh, that we're producing too many lawyers for a four hundred billion dollar economy. Uh, the truth is, as I said earlier, uh, that 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 is, that may well be so if we assume that lawyers. Uh, uh, only play an economic role, uh, but I think lawyers play a much broader, uh, broader role in society. There's so many roles that lawyers play that are not necessarily of immediate or at least not direct economic relevance, but are of relevance to the maintenance of a civilized society, that are relevant to the protection of, of the rights of, uh, of citizens. So uh, and when, we, when we look at it from that perspective, I actually don't think we have too many lawyers. I think we have too many lawyers trying to do the same thing. But if we um, opened uh, lawyers up to the, to the various other roles that they're expected to play in society, uh, and if we made those roles as important, if we recognize them the same way, we recognize uh, commercial success, then I think we would encourage a lot more lawyers to head in that direction, I would realize that we don't actually have too many. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. Um, Mr. Mr. Uche Matthew has, has asked the question that um, senior corporate counsel and um, the seniors of uh, the senior corporate counsels hardly encourage or allow their juniors to attend or participate in MBA activities. How do you intend to integrate that? How do you intend to get them 
if you elected the presidents of the NBA to get them to participate actively in the affairs of the NBA? I mean, that is, that is a, it's a wonderful question. And it goes back to the point I made earlier when uh, we were talking about the various groupings. Um, and you were saying that what, what was the NBA um, going to do to reach out to them? Uh, and the point really is that, you know, I, I think all lawyers ought to reach out uh, to the NBA. And I've heard this, you know, there are even lawyers who are interested in participating in NBA activities, but whose employers, uh, you know, would say to them that, what's, what's your business with the NBA? You know, you've been employed to, to deliver a particular service. Um, you know, NBA is not... <laughs> It's not part of, it's not, it's, not, it's not on the horizon. Yeah. We, we, we need to change that mindset. Uh, yeah. And those who have interests should be permitted uh, to participate. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a two way street, really. There has to be uh, cross fertilization of, of ideas, and lawyers must show more interest. And as I say to those who, who I am seeking support from, I say we must also hold our leaders to account. Um, talk, talk is cheap. But if, if, if I or any of the other aspirants to various yeah. NBA offices make a whole load of promises uh, yeah. and then you vote any of us into office and you don't hold us to account to okay. deliver on those promises, then we wouldn't have done ourselves any favors. Mm. Okay. Um, beautiful, sir. Um, my next question, I, I have um, an, another question here. Um, so an anonymous... Um, question here. We have, um, so he has, a, he has said, thank you, Lenny Silk. He wants to know what your views are on the ban placed on in-house counsel from representing their employers in court proceedings. He feels that there are many in-house counsel who have the experience to represent their employers in court, but are prevented from doing so, given the, they are prevented from doing so. But he feels that given the present legal regime as per the rules of professional conduct, is there anything you can do if elected to address this issue? I think that is the, the probably the largest, biggest elephant in the room, or whether it's gorilla, whatever animal we want to 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 choose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, as between uh, in-house counsel and um, uh, and uh, private practitioners. Mm. Um, and on another on another forum last week, I, I was I was quite frank in saying that look, this is something that I think we we must have a frank discussion about. <laughs> The, the, no matter how sympathetic um, I, I might be to the concerns of corporate counsel who feel that the restrictions contained in the rules of professional conduct are, are too extensive. Um, the, the, the fact is, if we don't have such restrictions, then we might as well eliminate we, not we might as well, we would naturally be eliminating a significant proportion of the source of livelihood of legal practitioners. Because if large corporate organizations like Berger Paints, like the banks, um, could engage lawyers in-house to represent them in court and do everything that external counsel do, then really what would external counsel have to do? Because you know, they'll probably just increase the number of lawyers they have in-house, put them on a fixed salary and say, well, you know, we were sued, you, you go. Um, we have this uh, major M&A transaction to, to engage in, you, you, you deal with it. It would, it would basically make uh, private practice non-viable. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we must, I, I mean, my honest view is that some of those restrictions have to remain. Now, do they all have to remain? I don't think so. So I think there's a discussion that we have to have around the provisions of, I think it's section, I, I don't know what section it is of the rules of professional conduct, but I think the blanket restrictions are probably too broad because it also raises the, 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 the flip side of that question is, what is the point of an in-house counsel being engaged if the rules of professional conduct effectively say that he or she cannot perform any, any legal function you know, for the employer? So we have to strike a balance. And that is, that is one of the areas where I think it is important that corporate counsel mm. are engaging mm. actively with the NBA mm. because the rules of professional conduct definitely are long overdue for, for review as well. Mm. Uh, I, I, don't think we will, I don't think we should eliminate those restrictions completely. Yes. 
example, I think we need to renegotiate them. Okay, sir. Beautiful, beautiful question. And to support um, what you have just said, we have Mrs. Ayatala Jagun, who also feels that um, if that is done, if the restrictions are taken off, it will represent so it will create some sort of conflict of interest situation. Uh, um, and lack of, lack of independence. Exactly, sir. Yeah. Um, so we have the next question we have, sir, is that there is a bill before the National Assembly to amend the Companies and Allied Matters Act. Um, one of the proposed amendments is the deletion of Section 35.4 of CAMA, which gives lawyers the exclusive privilege to sign statutory declaration of compliance when incorporating a company. Most junior lawyers are earning a living on the basis of this provision. His question is, is there a step or measure you can take to prevent this deletion from happening? I would definitely um, uh, argue against, uh, against that deletion uh, occurring. Um, I, I already know that a lot of lawyers, not just young lawyers, uh, a lot of lawyers are up in arms about the, the fact that um, their work at the Corporate Affairs Commission, uh, the role they play in the incorporation of business um, entities uh, is being eroded. But the, 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 the challenge, the greater challenge for me though, uh, and I've made this clear to lawyers who, who raised this, is that the greater challenge I think that we will confront in this area is, is not so much uh, the amendments to the laws, but the encroachment of, of technology. Um, and the fact that we also as, as members of, of, um, of society uh, and who also have a stake and an interest in the growth of our economy must be aware that there is a pressure a uh, significant pressure to uh, uh, improve on the ease of doing business uh, in Nigeria because we're competing for investment. And that one of the criteria uh, for ease of doing business world over is the ease and the cost attached to establishing uh, business entities. So I, I think that pressure, which is leading the CAC to try, has uh, been trying for a while, uh, is still struggling with it, but it's getting there slowly to automate its processes. It's sooner or later going to eliminate this as a, as a source of work for lawyers, as a significant source of work anyway. Because sooner or later, you know, business people are going to be able to incorporate businesses online without using any third party uh, interface, be it lawyer or non lawyer. But for as long as um, that hasn't occurred yet, uh, I think we should do the best we can to, to protect that source of livelihood for, for lawyers. Beautiful, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, for that position. And um, um, we also have a question from Mr. Nonso Aze, who is the head of legal for APMT at Papa Limited. His, his question is: There is this unwholesome presumption that in-house counsel, in-house lawyers are not practicing lawyers, and he's asking what can we do to change this negative connotation, given that law practice goes beyond law firm activities. It feels that like a lot of corporate councils have had extensive law firm practice and continue to add positively to building a philosophy of law in line with best international standards. So he's asking what can be done to change this narrative that in-house lawyers are not practicing lawyers, especially in, the view, in view of the fact that they've contributed to building the philosophy of law. I, I think that that is, it, it, it's, um, what would be the appropriate word to describe this now? I, I, I'm not, perception comes to mind, but I'm not sure it's even perception. It's not a perception issue. I think it's a misconception issue. Um, I know a lot of lawyers who are in-house who were in private practice. I know a lot of lawyers who were in, uh, and vice versa. Mm. You know, law, 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 law is such a versatile uh, profession. I know lawyers who have been in-house who have gone into academia. I know lawyers who have been in academia who have come into practice. We, we are able to do a variety of things. So I agree mm. entirely with uh, Mr. Azi that for anybody to say that, oh, because you are in-house, you are not uh, practicing or you're not a practicing lawyer uh, is a misconception. But then there are, there are different types of practice. Indeed, one of the things that, um, you know, as I was saying earlier about, about uh, providing guidance for young lawyers coming out of law school, 
uh, one of the things I would like to, to, to do is to engage with distinguished practitioners in-house, in academia, in the human rights uh, uh, environment, uh, in government, et cetera, and get them to tell these young lawyers their stories. Because these stories are not, there's no one size fits all. You know, there are lawyers who have gone through the entire gamut. There are some who, either because they were so focused, had gone straight into just one aspect of practice. And they all come, they come with different, you know, the benefits, the pros and cons. Is it better to first uh, uh, practice in a firm before going in-house? Is it better to go in-house first and then go out? Is it better to go in, out, in, out, as some people have done? <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no one size fits all. So to say to any particular lawyer that, oh, you're not in practice because you're in-house, or that it's only if you wear the wig and gown that you're a lawyer. I, that, I, I don't share that school of thought. And the truth is, again, I, I, as I'm speaking to in-house counsel, I know a lot of in-house counsel who their knowledge of the law uh, uh, trumps that of those in practice. So it really is, uh, like I said, I think it's a misconception. Mm. Sure that. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for that. Um, and we also have a question from Ms. Ayotola Jagun, um, who, are, who wants to know, she, she says that there's been a gradual erosion of the rule of law in our policy, and this is of great concern. Um, she says, she's asking that what will you do as president of the NBA if elected in strengthening the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary and the constant overreach of executive powers by MDAs and organs of government? Uh, I, I, I think, um, again, that is one of the greatest challenges facing us now in, 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 the, in, the, in the society because um, the rule of law presupposes uh, obedience uh, to, to court orders. Uh, that is the entire foundation on which uh, civilized society is based, that might is not right, and that there is an impartial and independent arbiter, which is the judiciary, uh, and that irrespective of who, who is uh, on the other side, whether it's government, uh, whether it's another individual, whether it's a big man or a small man, that that independent arbiter will uh, make deliver a fair decision and that that decision will be obeyed. Now, we're in a situation in Nigeria where we see time and again that that, that precept, that basic precept of law uh, is being turned on its head. Uh, and there are too many instances now in which court orders are not being obeyed. There might, there, there's a variety of reasons for this. People complain about the lack of independence of the judiciary. Um, we complain about the fact that the judiciary is um, dependent on, on the executive for, for its funding uh, and a variety of things. But my honest belief is that this challenge is truly a challenge of the mindset and the quality of our judiciary. Independence is not a vague concept. Independence is a mindset. You know, if, if we had, back in the day, even when we had military regimes, when we had people walking around with jackpots, we had a judiciary that would stand up against government and say that, you know, we would declare this decree unconstitutional and we would not entertain matters uh, involving the government until our orders are obeyed. But today, um, the, the, the majority of our, of our judicial officers don't seem to have that independence of mind. And I think that is the real challenge. Because when people say to the NBA that what are you going to do about disobedience to court orders? I mean, what first occurs to me is that the, the judge who made the order, what has he or she done about the disobedience to his or her order? Because, you know, the dignity of the judiciary is, 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 is it should be sacrosanct. Looking to the NBA or looking to individual lawyers, um, to ensure uh, enforcement of the orders of a court, I, I think is the judiciary shirking its responsibility. Definitely the lawyers have a role to play in activating the necessary processes um, where an order has been disobeyed, perhaps initiating contempt proceedings, um, you know, seeking ingenious, a variety of ways of 
of, of compelling obedience. But at the end of the day, the judiciary itself must show a lot more uh, angst and concern about the fact that its orders are being disobeyed. I'm not, I'm not, yes, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing that. So it, it's a problem. And I think that, you know, there's no magic wand that anybody is going to wave to solve that problem. For me, it's a long-term, at least medium-term solution is to improve the quality of personnel that are going into the judiciary. We need to ensure that the people have the right mindset, um, that they have the right uh, training, uh, they have the right skills, and that they, you know they're not, because some of them have lost their independence even before they get on the bench, because they get on the bench as political appointees. They become judges because they know somebody in government. So the independence is lost even before uh, the game started. So these are things that we need to nip in the bud, and I think the NBA has a significant role to play them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so um, the next question we have is from Miss Cecilia Madweke, Commissioner Secretary, uh, Legal Advisor for Judas Georgia and Nigeria PLC. Um, she she says that we are working. Can I can I can I, can I make can I can I make a disclosure? That that's a oh. question for my for my sister. For, for your okay. for your sister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's nice to know. So she feels that um, we are working in perilous times, um, and sometimes the fires become personal and, and a crusade. He's asking, she's asking if you are ready for this, and how do you intend to ensure that the legal structures in Nigeria are well protected? I told you she's my sister now, so she's concerned <laughs> for my she's concerned for my safety and well-being. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Well, you know. It goes back to the question I was asked a few days ago, you know, recently, as things have started to heat up that, um, oh, you're too soft, you're too much of a, of a gentleman. Are you sure you can confront the, the regal uh, uh, or the challenges of this office you're seeking? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I say that, you know, the, the, the taste of the pudding is in the, in the eating. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily by... Um, making noise uh, or being seen to be loud and perceived to be aggressive. Um, I, I think the, the challenges confronting us, what they require is, is character, uh, character and conviction. If, if, you, if you have character and you have conviction, um, I don't think anything will shake you. And I believe that I have both of that in, in, in large, large, large quantities. Um, the, 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 the worst thing that can happen, uh, and which to a degree, and, and I mean, I'm not pointing fingers uh, at anybody, but I think that our profession, you know, when, people, when people think back to the days of Alawa Kabashon, it's because he was, it wasn't because he was loud or noisy, it was because he was resolute. He was resolute and he could not be, he could not be bought, he could not be swayed. Uh, I believe I'm cut out of that same cloth. So I have no, I have no, I have no doubts that I, I will be able to to withstand the, the challenges that uh, will come with this office. Um, as a as a follow up to that, also uh, maybe this is my question to you. Um, since joining the NBA presidential election race, um, what has been your expectation? What what is your expectation vis-a-vis -vis, um the reality? Um, was it was this what you expected it was going to be or? What has been your experience so far? My experience has been actually um, extremely rewarding. Um, and I, you know, it, it's been rewarding, it's been fulfilling. I, I've been to parts of this country that I would never have had cause to, to, to go to. Um, I've met people um, that give me, a, a, you know, a, a great amount of faith. Of course, some have some have been major disappointments, but I've met people that give me given me some a great amount of faith in the the potential for this country, if we would only allow the right people um, to get into the right positions, and 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 I I believe uh, quite honestly that there is a yearning. People want a change. People are yearning. People in our profession, people in society at large, are yearning for a different type of of leadership, be it at professional level like the NBA or at every other level. And that if they see 
if they perceive sincerity, uh, they, they're actually, you know, keen to, to give uh, uh, that, that person an opportunity uh, to prove his or her. So that, that, is, that is what I found, and, and, I, and I find it quite uh, encouraging. Uh, so I, have, I have absolutely, whether I win or, or lose, I have absolutely no regrets uh, for stepping forward because uh, uh, for me, it's been, it's been an eye opener. Mm, beautiful, beautiful, sir. Um, I just have one or two questions um, because I know we are well significantly out of uh, out of time. Um, my question is this: um, being a boardroom guru yourself, um, uh, there's been since the argument uh, from some quarters, especially in corporate council space, that um, company secretaries should actually be considered for be for being directors. Uh, I know that in, in some companies, actually, they have that structure because of the critical role um, the company secretary plays. Um, being a member of the board also, um, I want to have your thoughts on, on this argument um, from some quarters to feel that um, the company secretary, in, by virtue of his role, um, he sits across different sets of board members. Um, so in some, in a lot of instances, it's probably the most experienced in terms of how that, in terms of institutional knowledge and how the boardroom has worked. And so some people have made the case that company secretaries should not just stop at being company secretaries, they should be considered in some, in some circumstances to be um, directors. What are your thoughts on this, sir? I, I, I think that, that that makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, the, the, the role of the company secretary as the guardian of um, the, the corporate governance or of any uh, corporate entity um, definitely places him or her in a very good position uh, to step up from being company secretary uh, to being a board member. But I, I, I would stop short of... Um, making it appear as though we are arguing for an automatic promotion. You know, that once you're company secretary, then, you know, you know automatically you, you graduate from there to a board position. But I, I definitely don't see any reason why a company secretary uh, who exhibits the, the, right, um, uh, the right skills uh, on the job uh, should not be given consideration. Uh, for board appointments when um, when when they come come clear and and indeed this is one of the areas where I think um, um, the, the NBA uh, has to uh, work together with corporate council as as a as a group because one of the complaints I've heard uh, is that even within corporates um, and this 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 complaint I heard particularly with the banks I don't know it might apply to other corporates as well. But that if, if a cohort, if a cohort of graduate trainees, for example, uh, join a corporate institution uh, and some are lawyers and they go into the legal department and others go into mainstream aspects of what that corporation does, the chances are that the lawyers will hit a glass ceiling a lot quicker uh, and that their progress through the organization is halted, whilst those from other disciplines tend to, you know, the sky is the limit for them. I mean, that is something that I think that as a profession, uh, we must tackle. There must, there must be, there shouldn't be any reason why, you know, being a lawyer in a corporate organization should restrict you or, or limit your ability to, to rise through the, the organization, which, which, you know, ties in with your question. If you're a company secretary, why, why shouldn't you be eligible? for a board appointment or even for the CEO position. Beautiful, sir. Thank that, that's quite beautiful position, sir. And, and I actually align, align with that, especially because I, at, uh, to some extent, I can say that um, a lot of con corporate counsel have said this. Um, uh, I, I think this comes from the perception that um, where corporate counsels are engaged in, in safe, a financial institution, for instance, they are seen as back-end staff. And so um, a financial, for the finance um, guys, they, they, you know, they go up, but their lawyers are considered that they have a limit to which they can go. So it will be quite interesting to see what the NBA can do uh, under a award team elected. Um, we have a comment here by um, the managing director of uh, DCSL, uh, Mrs. BC Ademi, who also feels and subscribes to your 
your opinion that company secretaries should be able to aspire to the board, same way as other senior management um, get appointed as executive directors. Yeah. So my final question, sir, will be um, for the indecisive lawyer, um, what should, um, for the indecisive lawyer, what would you say to them to make them decide to vote for um, Dr. Obayitunde Ajibade as the president of the NBA? Um, I think two things. Two things, the, the first and for me the most important is, is um, my integrity. Um, I think that the, the perception of our profession over the years has suffered a significant battering because um, too many uh, of us uh, have been perceived as behaving uh, in less than stellar uh, manner. Uh, and I think we need to do everything we can to remedy, to remedy that and to redeem the image of the profession. Uh, and I think you know, electing uh, leadership that doesn't have um, blemish or, or question marks is a step in, in, that, in the right direction where that is concerned. But sec secondly, uh, and perhaps less subjective, because you know whether I have blemish or not, I suppose is that's my view. Yes. <laughs> others, others, others obviously perform their own. Their own view. So, yeah. but but I think more more objective is the fact that of the contenders for for the office of president of the NBA, uh, I don't think anybody can dispute the fact that I'm the one that has the, the broadest base in terms of experience. Um, I'm a litigator and a senior advocate of Nigeria by virtue of that. Um, I'm a, an experienced corporate practitioner. I, I have a significant number of transactions under my belt. I used to chair the Capital Market Solicitors Association, like you said. Uh, on top of that, I, I also sit as an arbitrator, uh, which is the next closest thing to being a judge because um, I have a clear understanding of the rigors that um, judicial officers go through in having to listen to uh, a variety of arguments and try and arrive at what is what is the justice of the matter. So I, I think this variety of experiences cannot but stand me in good stead relative to the other contestants in addressing the concerns of the various um, various uh, aspects of our profession uh, that require attention. So mm -hmm. that, that that would be my my reason for saying that. Uh, hmm. uh, um, beautiful, sir. That's quite um, impressive. Um, I don't know if I can quickly take one more question, which you have just asked. Oh God. Um, so we have a question from Mr. Nonsu, head of legal um, for APMT. He feels that, um, sir, are you going to be able to do something if elected pre MBA president about lawyers grooming? He feels that over time, a lot of lawyers have looked rather on camps and lack social decorum. It feels that there is a need to reposition the brand because the level of respect we get as lawyers is a direct correlation to our composure, knowledge, service, mannerism, and decorum. Is there any plans? What do you have? Are you planning to do anything at this time? Yes, I, I, I mean, I think this is just the flip side of what, what I said about, um, uh, or what I just said about the, the redeeming the image of the profession. Uh, and this actually touches on what in my in my manifesto uh, I've identified as the flagship, you know, what I, I consider to be the immediate uh, and most urgent priority, which is addressing the welfare of the legal professional. <clears throat> and the welfare of the legal professional, you know, there's a there's a wide there's a wide gamut. Um, so there's the welfare of the legal professional right from magic circle firms in even in our in our in our own um, environment who might feel threatened by uh, a competition from international law firms. So we need to protect their welfare, even though some will say that they're already doing very well, but we need to make sure that they do even better. You know, when I talk about building scale, I think we also want 1,000 lawyer, you know, 400 partner law firms in Nigeria, and we need to protect uh, that market to enable them to develop that scale. But then at the other end of the spectrum is the fact that there are too many lawyers in Nigeria today who are struggling even to put a meal on the table for their families. Mm. You know, I, and I say that if we don't address the welfare of the legal professional, 
at mm. all ends of the spectrum, we will get the kind of issue that um, Mr. Azi has raised, uh, because the, the conditions uh, under which a lot of lawyers are, are operating, it, it really is not a condition that any lawyer should be proud of. And every time you see a lawyer in that state, you know, unkempt, uh, looking hungry, disheveled, uh, it, it reflects on all of us, no matter how well we are doing. Yes. Because society thinks if that's a lawyer, mm. uh, if that's the way lawyers are, uh, then they, they, they can't really be, be saying much. So we, we are, I agree with him entirely that we need to address this. But I think the way to address this is to address the welfare of the legal professional in a holistic manner. Not just those at the top end, but yes. also those at the bottom end. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I, I know we've taken a lot of your time, and I know um, in the build up to the elections, um, you'll be having a lot of interviews, a lot of meetings. And so um, I want to thank you for finding time to, to speak to us. Um, I believe that um, a lot of my colleagues also um, have gained significantly um, um, from this party. Um, so I want to thank you and um, I want to appreciate you and also everybody that has found time to join this um, meeting. Uh, Finally, I'll just call on the um, organizers, Kaizen Academy, who has organized this, um, to give a word of thanks to everybody that has joined this meeting. Ms. Obiali Geli Madrid Davis. Ms. Obiali Geli Madrid, are you there? Okay, I think I need to give a. Uh, um, Okay, so while I think she's struggling to come in, so I'll just I'll do the vote of thanks on her behalf. So, um, dear Lenesi, thank you so much. I I know I know it. I know the effort it took for you to actually find time out of your schedule to meet with us and um, also speak to corporate councils and address some of the issues which you uh, which has bothered um, which has bothered us and. Um, wish you all success, wish you every success in the election. Um, I also want to use this opportunity also to appreciate um, corporate councils and company secretaries, heads of legals who have um, found time to, to join this meeting. Uh, Ms. Obiageli, if you are here, you might just say a word or two. Ah, okay, so I think you're still having that problem. So thank you so much, um, Lenesio. We appreciate you. Thank you very and, much. And we, Wish you the best as you uh, uh, as you um, go closer to the election, and um, just like uh, Ms. Ma uh, Ms. Cecilia Madupe has said, we hope the rigors won't be too much for you to deal with, <laughs> as we care about your uh, welfare. Thank you so much Thank again. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, it. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Bye. -bye.